one thing that is really exciting to me is that soil health can be the one thing that everybody agrees on in agriculture as important and beneficial to current and future production. So it's really something that everybody can be involved in and excited about together. Welcome everyone. And we certainly thank you for joining us today and being here with us. So let's jump right into it here. So for many of you, I, I recognize many of the names that I saw on the attendee list already this morning as having joined us back in September of 2020 when I did a soil sessions webinar about yield data collection. And in that session, we discussed a lot of the basic components of a yield monitor, how they work, how to set it up, how to properly calibrate the system, uh, things like making a plan for how the data left your field and special considerations that we needed to think about going into harvest last fall, a dry harvest that, that moved along rather rapidly and didn't have very many breaks in the stream for many of us. And I, I hope that many of you got to see that session because it kind of lays the foundation for what we're going to talk about today as we move on from the data collection process. So for today, the things that we're going to talk about are what do we do now that we have that yield data? So first and foremost, we're going to spend some time discussing how we go through the process of taking yield data that is from a raw source and refining it into something that can be used for decision making, for furthering the, the, the cause of agriculture, and ultimately something that helps growers make more profitable decisions uh, and, and smarter decisions for the environment and inputs and all of that stuff for their farm. Of course, we're always going to look at some ways that you all as growers and as ag industry and, and many of the different groups that we saw represented here today. And we at SHP can use that refined product. And then finally, how those others in agriculture are, are using yield data and why they want to use the yield data that growers have collected in what they do and, and their day-to-day -day business as well. So let's jump right into this and talk about raw yield data as, or yield data as a raw source versus uh, where we're gonna go with it. So um, I, I like to think about the analogy of a steer versus a stake. The yield data that you see on your screen in the combine is a bit like serving a steer on a plate. You can pretend that it's the finished product. And if you're hungry enough, I guess that it can be the finished product. You can get what you want from that steer on the plate. But what you really want is that steak. So how do you go from the, from the raw resource to that steak? Well, in many instances, we have a butcher, a chef, and a grill that refine it into a better process. And yield data is much the same. We have professional people. We have training sessions for those that do it themselves. It, it's a skill that has to be honed in order to refine that process. And when that yield data is on that, on that stick or still in the monitor in the combine, we have to think of it as just that, a raw resource. The magic happens when you process the raw resource and turn it into the final product. You refine it into that state. So let's talk about uh, a, single, uh, a single yield data file. And I think this, in, first and foremost, is a place where a lot of people get hung up. Yield data can have different values depending on how you look at it. So on the top here, we have what is called the, uh, the summary of selected um, blah, 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 general information. It's the yield monitor summary. In this case, this particular field is 77.07 .07 acres long. A monitor summary, which comes directly from your monitor, in this case shows 78.9 acres. Monitor summaries record every bit of data that goes into that combine, whether the, the combine is moving, whether the header height sensor is down or up, et cetera, et cetera. It records absolutely everything. It, it's the full source of, of everything that's out there in the field, but not necessarily tied to any geographic location. 
that's where the lower half of this screen comes into play. It's called spatial data records. This is yield data that only qualifies because it has a unique GPS position, a speed, and a head position on that combine. So in that case for this field, we logged 77.38 acres, or about one and a half acres less than what the raw version of this yield data came up with. And in this case, the, the yield monitor system had auto swath technology to it to prevent overlap. We had RTK for a GPS source, so very precise GPS. And those are some of the things that compound to make that difference. And even though they're very close on acres at just one and a half acres, they still have about a 2000 pound difference that we see here between the wet weight of the two files. So there is a value difference. And I know that through my 20 years of being in the retail world, this was a big hang up for folks right off the get go. Well, how can one system have two different values and which one's right? Well, it, in it, as confusing as it might sound to a degree, they're both right. They're both qualified different and have a different uh, set of parameters that make them correct. But that being said, for all intents and purposes, spatial data is what the industry standard is. The bottom one is what most people work off and what we talk about when we talk about yield data values and reporting for crop insurance and things like that. So as we move on to our next slide here, we see that we, we want to take yield data from, from kind of that gross raw product into to something that we can use. And yield data cleaning is done in a lot of different ways for a lot of different reasons. So this is a very simple example of what an ag retailer or a seed dealer or somebody that's providing a service to, the, to, to growers might do with yield data as a first pass cleaning. In this case, uh, we have the untouched spatial data on the left-hand side. We've got retailer cleaned yield data on the right-hand side. And we see that retailer doing some simple things. They take away everywhere where the, um, where the yield is more than double the average, where it's less than one fourth of the average, where the swath width of that head was less than one half width the actual head size, speed is below two mile an hour, speed is above six mile an hour, et cetera, et cetera. Those basic things that can be done relatively quickly. In this case, we see that, that this version of cleaning removed about 5% of the GPS points on the field, but if you can read those, those little numbers on the side of each one of those, it only reduced the area of the map by about 2.1 acres and only reduced the total crop output of this field by about 50 bushels. So cleaning up a lot of parameters doesn't necessarily remove a lot of data, but it certainly refines that data that we have to be a more accurate representation of what the field actually does. These maps, I kind of tend to call something that we use to remember a moment in time. They're, they're a record that helps us think about what happened that year, but they're not ready to show off. They're not ready to go to that next stage. And to begin talking about that next stage, I'm gonna turn it over to Jacob. So Jacob, take it away. Thanks, Keith. Um... So uh, how do we process and analyze yield data here at the Soil Health Partnership? Uh, our field managers are working with the growers. They, they collect the yield data and they bring it in. Uh, they, they import it into a software program that's designed to read the, the raw data because if you just open it up and you know, if you're even able to open it up into a software program, um, you, you get, some ones and zeros and some A's and B's, but you get a lot of Greek letters, symbols and whatnot. Uh, so it's it's not really in a usable format. So we convert it into a, a generic format um, that we can work with. And then uh, we clean out some of those areas such as end rows, uh, long waterways, um, any 
any of those features that uh, you know has excess of um, uh, may have more compaction. You know the equipment is turning around or parked on the end rows. Um, uh, so we, we remove that information, uh, and then with our our strips, um, we've got two different treatments side by side. Uh, you know, in perfect world, you line up exactly on that line between strips. Uh, but in the, the real world, you know, might drift a little bit from year to year. Um, and, uh, and you can have some edge effect, you know, treatment right next to another um, may have some impact. Plus the combines don't always land right on that line. So it's really important to um, clean out data around those boundaries between our, our treatment strips um, because um, we we don't want to have that impact you know it um, gives us a little cleaner data that way so we take out one pass one combine pass on either side whenever we transition so we have a good clean data um, and then we uh, as Keith said we take out the the extreme yield variables um, uh, combine speed variables uh, if you think about it, you know, it's all about speed and volume. So if you're traveling at, you know, a, a decent clip across that field, and then you have to slow down to go over a, uh, say, a, a rut created by irrigation system or you know, um, some other feature in the field, um, you slow down, all of a sudden, you're still getting all that grain coming through the combine, but you're traveling a lot fast or a lot slower, so your um, your yield is impacted. So uh, speed is kind of an interesting one to um, an important one to consider when we're cleaning the yield data. Um, and then we we analyze the data for uh, different um, uh, treatments and uh, control areas of the field and look at soil types so that the, our farmers can have informed decisions on what's going on in that field and uh, make informed decisions on their other fields as well. Uh, and then we utilize the data to um, uh, see a broader impact, uh, aggregate the data and look at long-term trends. So um, when we're looking at the yield data, um, you know, we're getting at as raw format, um, different crops. Every crop has a different uh, um, uh, different weight per bushel. Uh, oats are 32 bushels per, um, or th excuse me, 32 pounds per bushel. Corn's 56 pounds per bushel. So uh, if we're talking in bushels, it's really important to have uh, all those parameters set and utilize the raw data and make sure everything's calculated the same from field to field. Um, we have a bunch of cleaning steps uh, we take and we process through um, and uh, we pull in all of our, our strip maps, all of our treatment maps of our field. And then we have a nice uh, little script that we put in a, a system kind of looks like MS-DOS. If anyone's uh, been around long enough to remember uh, us utilizing that on your computer. And it spits back a bunch of ones and zeros uh, for us. So zero means it passed, one means it failed that cleaning step. So if it's um, too high of a yield, um, you know, it, it'll get a one. Um, if the combine was traveling too slow, um, it gets a one. And then we have that ability then to take that data and look at how it, um, uh, we, we can cherry pick, if you will, you know, what parameters are important for how we're looking at the data. Um, you know, if, if we want to look at, um, um, you know, we're not so concerned about moisture in this instance, we can um, ignore that or, you know, whatever, um, however we want to look at the data. And then it gives us the opportunity that we don't truly clean out all the data. All of the data still exists, but um, we can then understand what is going on in that field. So historically, we uh, we had a third party cleaning our data and um, they did an excellent job, uh, got us a great finished product, 
Um, but unfortunately, we didn't get any of that other data. All we got back was that clean data. Um, and uh, so we couldn't understand the dynamics of the rest of the field, what was happening in the end rows. Um, so now we, um, when we clean our data, we everything is still there. We have all of the yield data for the entire field. We know what was outside of our plot boundary, what was on the, um, the transition between two treatments, what's going on in the end rows. So if, if there was ever a need, we have that data and um, we can even apply new um, cleaning parameters um, or change some of the cleaning parameters, run some of that stuff again without having to run all of the data again. Uh, so it gives us a lot more flexibility. So it is really important to keep in mind what the final use of the data is. So uh, the example that Keith showed earlier, you do a quick clean, it gives you a great picture of what's happening out in the field. Um, great for work, record keeping, sharing with um, with insurance. Um, it, it It's a really, really good asset for the grower. When we do a deep clean, um, in the example on the right, all of the end rows are taken off. Um, we've cleaned a lot of uh, the data out, you know, up to a, a third of the data points are removed in this process. Um, even so, we've only lost um, about 700 bushels in this example, and our average yield has dropped by less than half a bushel. So um, for understanding what's happening in the field, this is really important. It gives us a, a nice, true, clean picture of what's happening but it's not necessarily something that um, you use for record keeping or um, sharing with insurance because it's just not accurate for those purposes. Uh, so it's really important to understand what you wanna use the data for, and how far do you clean it. So uh, another thing, this is kind of cool, you know, it's throughout NASA, um, uh, everything looks cool. So we. Um, we took some inspiration this last year from NASA on organizing all of that clean data because, you know, it, like I said, it's important to understand um, what level that data is, if it's deep clean or uh, moderately clean, so we know where we can use each file. So when we get the first round of data in, raw monitor data straight from the combine. It's not been altered. It's exactly what that combine um, provided us. Um, so, but it's not really useful in that form. So we put it into a generic format. Um, so we call that level one. So the, the nice thing of this is you can look at the, the yield files really easily. If you have a one or a zero in that file name you know exactly what data it is without having to investigate and look, open the file and see what's happening there. Um, and then we have a level two, this is process and clean data. Our process that we use does not alter the data. It, there can be some changes from level zero to level um, one, just it's inherent when you're working with software programs. Um, when you bring in that raw data, it has to interpret that information. And, uh, and so then you get another, um, you know, it might shift slightly. Um, if you ever have, um, you ran a, a copy machine, you take and you make a copy and then you throw the, the copy that you just created and put it back in the machine and take another copy. If you do that enough times, some of the, the text um, or the picture that you're copying kind of disappear a little bit. And there's little gaps or there can be some black splotches across the, um, uh, the copy. And it's just not quite as clear as the original. And so it's really important to track how many times you've copied that. So when it goes from raw data to generic data that we can open up in Excel or some other software program, um, it's really important to not repeat that. So you don't want to bring that generic data in and then make another copy of it. Um, we don't see a lot of change, but we see some. 
And then our final um, level that we have is the cleaned only data. So that's kind of what we had historically. It's um, it can be very useful in certain circumstances. If you're just looking at that clean data, you don't have to worry about making sure you filter out the stuff that you don't want to look at. Um, but you lose sight of what's happening outside of those strips or outside of that clean data. Um, and you can't really go back once it gets at that level to level two. Uh, so that is how we do that. Um, another way to think about this is if you have a tree, that's like your raw data. It's, it's really handy. Um, you can sit under its shade. Everyone wants it. It looks nice. Um, but there's only so much you can do with it. So you cut it down, you turn it into a log. There's all kinds of things you can do with a log. You can make a log cabin. Um, you can make a, a bench out of a log. You can, um, there's all kinds of things you can do. Um, fence posts, you name it. Um, but it's limited, right? So, you take it to a sawmill and you make boards out of it. Now you got boards and now you can make an entertainment center and you could make a bed or, or a bookshelf, all kinds of things you can do with that, but you can't make a log cabin anymore with it. And similarly, you got your entertainment center. You can put a TV, stereo, um, books, movies on there, but you can't turn it around and make it into a bed or a dresser and you certainly can't make it into a lock cabin anymore so it's important to understand what you have and realize what you can use that data for the other thing keith kind of hit on this a little bit it's a snapshot you know you look at yield especially if you're just looking at the the yield uh the bushels um that is just a picture. You know, you ever see a funny picture? Um, you're like, what happened? How did how did this person get to this point um, that I'm looking at here in the picture? You don't you don't have any of that back information. Same thing with yield. You see a low yielding spot on that field. You don't know is it lacking on nutrients? Um, does you know is there insect pressure? Was there weed pressure? Disease pressure? Did equipment Get parked out there is there a wet spot is there a slope there's a lot of different things that could come into that you know 40 per, 40 plus decisions across that year came to that point of seeing that low yielding spot in that field um, so good yield data should create more questions than it provides answers you should look at yield data and say why is this happening? Why am I seeing low yielding here, but high yielding there? And it should drive you to investigate and, and figure out what is limiting. So if you've ever seen the barrel stave, um, you're never, you can never produce more yield than lowest um, limiting factor. So if you're limited by nutrients, um, even though you have um, controlled your your insects, your weeds, your diseases, taking care of everything else in there. If you don't have the nutrients, you're not gonna produce any more yield by taking care of those other things. So um, it's just like those 40 plus decisions. There, there is more information than just the yield. Um, so you've got moisture, elevation, a uh, bunch of different factors in that yield file that you can look at. So it's, it's, Yield is more than just one picture, it's many pictures, but it still is a snapshot in time. At SHP, um, what we do with our yield data, first and foremost, is we create a yield report that we provide back to our growers. Um, a couple of things, you know, example here is we have um, a map of the soil in the field so we can understand um, you know, how those treatment and controls are interacting with the different soil types. Um, but we also include how much um, how much area that soil type is. So if you look at the soil type on the right, on the um, image on the left, uh, you'll see there's very little acre um, area there. So 
even though we see a little bit of drop in the treatment, we're really not looking at a whole lot of land. So it, it's kind of difficult to really make informed decisions on that um, like we can with the other two soil types. Uh, we also provide just the, the raw data. How does every treatment strip in the field perform? Um, you know, the, the, this is really important for our growers so they can make informed decisions on this deal. And you say, well, my, you know, cover crop did better in this soil type in this field. I have that soil type in this other field. Maybe I should put it there before putting it in this, um, you know, field C that had this soil type on the right that didn't do as well. Um, so it, it provides them a little bit of uh, information so they can make those informed decisions. Uh, another thing that we do is we, we look at, um, you know, imp impacts of the, so of the, uh, the treatments over time or um, general trends and aggregate the data together from uh, all of our sites. Uh, and one of the important things that we've noticed is we don't see a drastic yield difference between, uh, say, cover crop and no cover crop or, um, uh, you know, in our fields. So, uh, there might be a slight difference, and you can see in these two bar graphs, but it's not significant. Um, and all of our, you know, every strip has its own background. You know, strip A versus strip B. Um, strip A could historically always be lower yielding than strip B, and it depends on which treatment goes there. That's why we have um, eight strips in most of our fields, so that um we can reduce that that impact of um what's happening in one strip versus another or looking at a larger area another another example here is uh this is from 2019 as well uh when we looked at yield loss of at least two bushel per acre 100 percent of the time it was cereal rye was the primary cover crop species well that that kind of looks bad for cereal rye, um, but the point here is um, not to not do cereal rye, but look deeper and see what's actually happening um, to get to that number. You know, it's a snapshot in time, like like the yield data. Um, but in reality, cereal rye is one of our um, is one of the most popular cover crops out there. So it's on a lot of farms. So it's not surprising that um, we would see uh, cereal rye have a high number in this area. But if you look at the bottom of the chart, we see that 50% of the time that yield loss was greater than two bushel per acre, it was planted green. Um, whereas if we looked at stuff that was terminated more than two weeks prior to planting, we saw a 50 per, 57% um, of the time it there was a, a two bushel an acre uh, yield gain seen up in these plots. So um, it's important to really understand what's going on, not just um, stop at you know the face value of that yield data. You know, actually drill down and see what's actually you know the dynamics. Um, you know, this data is very helpful. If I was a new grower looking at this, I'd say I want to make sure I terminate more than two weeks prior to planning so that I'm more successful. Um, and I will hand it back to Keith to wrap this up. Well, thank you, Jacob. I think we did a great job uh, illustrating how an organization like SHP, or in this case, exactly that, SHP, utilizes yield data with the partnerships that we have with the growers we work with. I think it's also important to, to illustrate a few points here as to how growers might want to use yield data to dig into some of these questions for themselves. So first and foremost, I think it's an important thing to remember that anytime you have two data layers, you can build a data layer off of that to answer a question. The question you have to ask yourself is, does that combination, first of all, make sense? 
And two, does it seem like it would be likely to buy to provide you with some valuable insight for your farm? In this case, the layer on the left is one that designates uh, the area of the field that is irrigated by the center pivot for me. And on the right, I've got a soybean yield map off of this field from this last season. So to me, a question might be, well, can I put this together and figure out if my investment in irrigation, the number of acre inches I put on and the cost of water per acre inch was a profitable endeavor when I remove all the other factors out of looking at this. So I did just that on the next map here. I put the two together and I combined it. Got the help of my agronomist, did it myself, whatever. Um, I put in a standard crop price. I put in a standard cost for irrigation and I used it to make this map that looks at, uh, looks at income when considering water applied. Uh, if I were in an area with limited irrigation availability, I might use this as a decision-making tool to help me decide if variable rate irrigation cap capabilities would make sense for this field. Would it make sense to equip this with a speed control where part of the northern part of this field gets less water applied when it goes over it or more water applied when it goes over it to help stabilize some of that income? Or would I put less on or more on in that nice blue area that's on the directly west side of the field? This is a perfect example of, I put two data layers together, I got an answer. Now I've got to decide just how deep the question goes before I, I vote to do something with my wallet and, and move on from there. So harvest maps can also, uh, not can also, probably one of the most important things that we can do with harvest maps is combine them to get to a deeper understanding of what's going on out in the field. So in this example, I have a single yield map from each one of the last four years that this field was in corn. I could think about beginning to vary my input decisions based off of any one of these yield maps. And I could create a variable rate application for nitrogen, for seed, for phosphorus, uh, for fungicides, pick whichever input that you want to talk about. But as we talked about before, any one of these single yield maps is just a representation of what that yield was based off of the weather and the input decisions that we made for that particular yield. So if that's my strategy, which one of these four maps is the right one to choose to begin to base those input decisions off of? Well, to me, that's where we jump to what we have here on this page. When those layers are combined through, uh, through analysis, you can begin to, begin to eliminate some things. Uh, some people call this an average yield map. Some people call it a normalized yield map. Uh, to me, and, and in the scope of, of GIS work, I think of this as a temporal stability map. Temporal meaning time. What is the stability? of my yield over time on this field. And that's exactly what we're looking for. We're looking at trends that hold true year in and year out on this field. Where does the good yield always come from? Where does the, the poorer yields always come from? And, and what areas uh, oscillate between the two or stay in the middle all the time? When time is added to these layers, it, it moderates those things like weather, disease, insects, and so on. There are many growers and precision ag specialists out there that have their own process to do this, but these maps are often called things like that multi-year average yield or yield goal maps. These are the maps that are, are the foundation for variable rate prescriptions for seed, fertilizer, nitrogen, and so on. They're much more reliable than any one yield map by themselves and therefore stacking them together increases the level of confidence that we can have in making those decisions. And some of those decisions, uh, some of the questions that we ask are only uh, limited by the time that you have and the imagination that you have to put them together. I've got some examples of ones that I've done through the, through the years. 
And every one of them was brought up because of a particular question or a very specific concern that the grower had. And they always come from the same place. Growers want to be the best at what they do. And they want to know that they've done the best that they can do. But none of these are possible without the foundation of a refined set of data in our toolbox, the refined yield map and other pieces as well. It, it's the same story when we start talking about application maps for our fertilizer inputs or water or insert whatever pass we've made across the field that we've created a data layer for based off of application. So I think this brings us to the point where we transition to that third idea that we wanted to talk about today. It's also important for us to think about how other people and other industries that are adjacent to or within ag might want and need to access yield data, both from a specific acre on a farm or from a broad range of acres. Now, don't, don't confuse this. This is not about conspiracy theories. This isn't about helicopters and SUVs uh, circling the section and, and watching your field year round or that satellite being above it. This is about a lot of legitimate companies out there that have real reasons that they want to partner with our growers and, and, and have access to that data. And, you know, I, I've got several of them up here. The one that really stands out, though, is that relationship with the ag retailer or agronomist. And I've got that as a closed loop for a very specific reason right now. That's one that's more mature that we're used to seeing uh, yield data fed from growers to that ag retailer, agronomist, seed dealer, whomever it is, and getting an application map back for variable rate seeding application or fertilizer application or whatnot. That's a loop that's already kind of found its own path to being closed. Whereas, you know, maybe working specifically with a seed company on a, on a yield plot or working with the machine dealer and the telematics that are with that yield data to improve machine efficiency or Silicon Valley or farm service agency. Some of those aren't necessarily such a clear path to a closed loop today, but it doesn't diminish the importance of uh, pardon me, of, of where that relationship goes. So I think one of the first ones we need to think about is carbon markets and their need for yield data. And I'm certainly not going to profess to be any sort of expert on carbon markets, but it is definitely something that is emerging out in the market right now that, that needs to have uh, due diligence put into it. And there's a considerable amount of ground to cover yet to fully understand how we as farmers will contribute to carbon markets down the road. But today, we know that many people believe that a key component to agriculture's impact on carbon and carbon markets will rely on accurate record keeping. Not just yield data and production history, but management practice verification and input decisions and things like that. Having quality yield data in a digital form that can be assimilated into the market space will help growers to potentially be able to capitalize on past management decisions and past years of activities, not just today going forward or whenever that day comes along going forward. It's, it's a lot of question marks and a lot of variables, but I would rather be sitting there with five, 10, 15 years of, of quality yield data in my pocket than zero or two. You know, another, another one is talking about weather data assimilation and modeling that is associated with weather data. Whether it's growing degree units or growing degree days, moisture use modeling for crops. Um, the reality is that, that when we want to go out there and put things in the field to measure weather, sensors are expensive and connecting remote sensors to networks and getting that data to the people that, that work with it is expensive to deploy. <laughs> Models are by far a cheaper method uh, of, of working our way through some of these problems. But building good models requires an incredible amount of data pertaining to many different variables 
and the ground truth thing that goes along with it to build that foundation for models. Imagery of, and yield of fields along with management and weather data are the, are the key inputs that are helping companies and academic institutions build and perfect these models. So there's definitely a draw there for why these folks want to have access to your farms and have access to, to input the data to help them refine a product that ultimately goes back to helping growers have better decision-making tools at their disposal. You know, of course, we, uh, we, we are more familiar with the product development acceleration. It, it, it's kind of a long-term tried and true method, whether it's seed chemistry uh, or even insurance, the ability to process and analyze data points uh, is so much greater today than it was 20 years ago. Maybe even five or eight years ago, a 10 acre plot might have a handful of, of weights that come off of the scale of this way wagon to be used to evaluate a product or evaluate a seed hybrid, whatever, at a strip level. But today, instead of dragging that way wagon out there, we're more likely to hit a button to transfer data on that yield monitor or hand them a USB card or a copy of that USB card to get 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 data points off of that farm to help them dial in and look at more specific variables like soil type, like weather, um, aspect, all sorts of things to help them get an even deeper understanding of that product performance and the variables that a particular area of the field was in. It, it, it ensures that you're sharing not just the data that you intended, uh, and it can be a challenge as well as being less stressful to have that availability at your fingertips. Finally, there are companies out there like, like Farm Mobile that I've got on the screen right here um, that believe and promote the idea that yield data has value to people other than just uh, y'all as growers. Um, they provide a, a platform for buyers and sellers to come together. And in their case, they make sure that the sellers or the farmers of data have the transparency to see who is wanting to buy the data and accept or reject that transaction. I've worked with Farm Mobile for, for several years when I was in the ag retail world. I'm not promoting them. I'm not, I'm, I'm not endorsing them. I'm just simply saying that there, there is this section of agriculture or this section of data analysis also that's coming to the forefront out there. And I'd be remiss if I also didn't mention that they offer products for benchmarking and helping growers compare to each other and, and give them a platform to collaborate, to accelerate their knowledge and accelerate their ways to grow out there. So there's this particular division of this as well that, that uh, all of these represent excellent reasons why somebody outside of your farm or outside of your circle of influence might want to have access to yield data and the things that you need to think about when you're in that, when you're coming up with the decision if you give them access or not. So yield can be an answer, but yield is also only a snapshot of the 40 plus management decisions and the weather for the last 150 or 200 days. Good yield data drives the person who is evaluating it to create questions that can be answered through additional analysis or disproved by additional analysis. We hope that today has helped you understand why there are variations in yield data from the monitor to the map and the need to take yield from a raw resource to a finished product before using it as a data or as an as a, as a input decision tool as well as how we at Soil Health Partnership look at and work with your yield data and some ideas for how you might want to use yield data to evaluate and learn from your operation. 